you are gifted. Imagine existing beyond the physical. The dead coming back to life. Ain't nobody immune here but us. You got anybody looking out for you, Rosie? I look out for myself. Shalaknai Shojrita Jayoji Netzaiguchen Ihli, Shiachanai Catherine Sa Stephen Peter Oji Gabakwa, Netzaiguchen Ihli, Dukdrin Sho Ihli. My relatives, my name is Princess Dajai Johnson. I am a Netzaiguchen person. My grandparents are the late Catherine and Stephen B Peter from Arctic Village, Alaska. And I'm so excited um, to be here moderating our panel with our relatives from the Circumpolar North. Um, I am an indigenous woman. I have traditional chin tattoos. My hair is medium length and curly and behind me is a bookshelf and peeping out of a corner is a guitar. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and make some space now for our um, to introduce a couple of our panelists. We have Inuk Jorgensen with us. We have El Amarea Aya with us, and we will shortly be having uh, Naila Inuksuk joining us. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you, Inuk, to introduce yourself. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here. Um, my name is Inuk. Uh, Inuk, yeah, I'm so um, I am uh, Inuit from Greenland. Um, I have um, short um, grayish hair um, in my early 40s. Um, behind me is a white room um, with, a, with a shelf with a couple of photos of my lovely kids. Yeah, I'm wearing a white t-shirt. Boris, my name is uh, Ella Maria Eira and uh, I'm from Godegeitno. I'm a Sami reindeer herder and also um, an artist and filmmaker and a musician and producer. Uh, right now I'm sitting in Tromsø uh, in a dark hotel room and I have blonde hair and uh, you see a TV there and yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and also I'm from Northern Norway actually. Go to Gate is from Northern Norway. Basicho, um, as I said before, <clears throat> I am so excited to be sharing this space um, with you all. And um, we'll go ahead and just hop into our conversation here. This is such an exciting time for us as um, indigenous people who are content creators and really, um, really utilizing our narratives sovereignty and telling stories from our own perspective. And I was wondering if you both could speak a little bit to how do you engage in filmmaking? Are you are you writers? Are you directors? Are you actors? All the hyphenates. Um, and um, also maybe um, speak a little bit to um, do you often create films that are scripted or are you guided more by experimentation? Um, and Inuk, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to start the conversation. Right, right, thanks. Yeah, well, um, I, um, I have a fascination for short, short content, right? So I, I make uh, short films. Um, I, um, I, I think a lot of the inspiration that I get is from, from my background and what I, what I find interesting. I mean, a lot of the things that I've been doing lately has to do with um, where I'm from. As I grew up in, in Southern Greenland, my, my family lives in Southern Greenland. And um, because Greenland is such a, such a huge, huge country with so few people living there, I mean, no or not many stories from Southern Greenland have been told. And I, and I find it interesting, you know, that area between um, local Inuit folklore and maybe some international uh, issues like, like global warming. I, I really find that that space between the global story and and the little personal story. I, I find that very very interesting to and to navigate those those waters and and do it in, in in the short form. As I feel that that for me, I think there's a little bit of a connection to the to the stories that uh, that my mom, at least my my Inuit mother, has been telling me growing up, because because the, these were short stories and so I think it's that kind of connection I I have to both my 
my home and the way I, I try and create my, uh, my own productions. Right. So I, I, well, I, I write and film my, my films, my, myself and they're, and, and they're documentaries or at least ordering on documentary. So. So when you say you write, so do you just have like somewhat of an, an outline or do you have a very clear idea of like what you want the documentary to be before you start going out there and start filming? Yeah, with my latest project, um, In the Shadow of the Duktabite, which is in the imaginative program this year, I, um, I, it, was, it was scripted. I mean, um, I don't know if you know, it's been a huge political issue in Greenland um, that um, they, they, there's this area in southern Greenland where there's a high concentration of rare earth minerals. And this, um, this Australian company wanted to, to dig out these um, rare earth minerals. And as a byproduct, they wanted to um, dig out uranium as well. And Greenland still being a, a part of, of, of Denmark. I mean, this whole uranium issue uh, was a big thing within the kingdom of Denmark because Denmark has a zero tolerance policy towards uranium, which the Greenlandic government ended in 2013. Team, I think it was. So, I mean, within the the people living in Greenland, I mean, there's a split almost right down the middle, 50-50s, to go for this, I mean, this huge potential income to uh, a country that, that needs income, pretty much. And, uh, I mean, and protecting what's sacred nature, pretty much. And, um, and I wanted to dig down in that problem. I have very strong feelings against a uranium mine, uh, of course, me growing up there. But I wanted to try and make a film where I didn't point fingers, but instead wanted to provoke people into thinking. So I, I, wanted, I wanted to make something that dealt with my own ex anxiety towards this, this, this whole issue, which was, which was huge. I mean, Greenland just had a call for an early general election this spring. And it was, I mean, uh, which was a very interesting political period in Greenland. And uh, I'm very happy, so to speak, um, that my film came out before this. And hopefully, uh, I'm not, it, it wasn't my film that made, made the snowball roll, so to speak, but I hope that it did just a little bit in making people think about what we're actually doing, selling our land to foreigners which I think is pretty much just a new form of colonialism, right? Now it's not Denmark, which is the colonial master of Greenland, and in many ways still is, but not all negatively. So I really feel that that whole issue, I think, was, was important. It was important for me to tell that story. Absolutely. I mean, I really resonate with that because in Alaska, of course, we... Um, also have an economy that is based on the extractive resource industry, um, oil, gold, oil in particular. And so um, that really resonates with me in the sense that we have to tell um, that story from our own lens, because um, I'm sure it's the case in Greenland as well. We have so many filmmakers that come from outside of our community that want to document what is happening um, but our unique um, placement, um, being on our traditional homelands and our perspective and opinion is so critical right now. Um, so I can't, I cannot wait to to see your work. And I, and again, I think that this is where we're at is just whatever you know issue. And sometimes it's not an issue because I believe also very strongly in the ability for us to use our, our voice, whether it's through poetry or singing or whatever art form um, to hopefully share with the world our, our values, our indigenous values of how we're all connected um, and, and why we need to work together at this critical point. Um, so um, thank you for that, Masi <clears throat> Enoch and um, El, I'll hand that same question over to you to, you know, talk a little bit about your approach to filmmaking and, you know, what inspires you and what your, um, you know, if you also like, you know, do you script things, you know, are you kind of experimental? I'd love to keep it open. 
Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and speak. And I have to say again, for you who are listening, that English is my third language. I speak Sami and then Norwegian and then English. So, well, I grew up in a small village outside Code Game in northern Norway. That village uh, is called Matze. And uh, there were only a couple of hundred people, Sami people, uh, living there at that time. And I grew up in a reindeer herding family. So I uh, thought the whole world was like just us. And when I um, like um, uh, watched the television and went outside from that small village, it was like, oh, the world is so much bigger and people are speaking another language than us from Madze. And um, then I, when I was a kid, then I grabbed my mom's film camera because she had always has a, had a film camera and always been filming us. Then uh, I grabbed that film camera and I started to film. And uh, the same with also with music because I'm also a musician. So I just asked my mom, can you buy me a, a small keyboard? And she said, well, you know, we don't have enough money, so <laughs> unfortunately. But then she worked as a teacher at the school and she used to open the music room for me. So I started to play uh, piano and then uh, started to film. And I, I just knew at that point I have to somehow uh, express myself because grow, grow, to, grow up, uh, to grow up in a reindeer herding family, it's really hard. It's, uh, you live another lifestyle as the other Nor Norwegians in uh, Norway. And we are mostly outside in the nature and you have to deal with all kind of weather. And we are uh, mostly only eating reindeer meat and we are always moving and herding the reindeers and the rain our reindeers is wild. They are not tamed. So, uh, and, and that was uh, a, a tough thing to do. I have to learn like to herd and have to learn like how to handle with the reindeer, how to handle with the, the, the weather. And also we don't use the compass. Uh, I have to like learn to know every water and mountain, almost every stone where we were. If suddenly storms comes, then I have to know where you are and you have to follow also the wind which direction is it coming when you are moving from here to here then you know okay maybe i'm lost a little bit now i have to go that way now so uh, i think that has been like uh, giving me a lots of uh, different dimensions of colors and another way of thinking also so but for me it's always been really important to tell stories that comes from my heart what's important to me, because I also know that no one else can't, they, they, don't, they do not have the same opportunity to tell the stories, uh, but I, am, I have as an artist and a filmmaker. So, uh, and then I just continued and, uh, and finally we got the, our first Sami film festival in Godkeno back in uh, 2003 or four or five. And then after that, Anna Laila started the International Sami Film Institute, uh, which give, she gave us the opportunity to tell, tell our stories from uh, like to being more professional, to have a professional film team around us. So, um, so the past years I have been making music videos and art films and also short documentaries and also uh, fic short fiction movies. And, um, and for me, it's, it has always been re really important to tell stories that people do not, not know almost nothing about. What is also sh like a huge shame for the Sami people to talk about. And also what's, what's the difficult things, what's the hidden things. So I always like jumped into those uh, themes and I want to explore, I want to know why, 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 why didn't the Sami woman, uh, like from 1800 to the 1900, why did they stop wearing the Sami hat, horn hat, for example? So I made a movie about that. And I asked my grandmother, my mom, and they didn't want to talk about it because they have been like that, for my grandmother, that was a huge, like a 
traumatic, traumatic uh, uh, life, a period in her life. So, um, and that I have been continuing. And for the couple of past years, for six years, me and my sister, Miley Seira, Miley Seira is also a filmmaker, uh, because we've been caught many times uh, as reindeer herders against the Norwegian government because they want to uh, to sell our land to companies like Startnet, who is been building a huge monster power line through our reindeer herding area. So me and my sister started to document this, and we started to following our father, our uncles, and all the reindeer district, the whole family. Every time we got letters or we have to go in court or well, also when we went out with our family to, to be there where our land is with our reindeer herd. So we started to document. So we've been doing that for the past years. And the last time we were in the court was last this year in January. While I was here in Tromsø at the Tromsø International Film Festival, I was also following my family where we were in court. So of course we lost against the Norwegian government as usual. So um, yeah, and also um, uh, for me, it's really important to be able to express myself through art. And, and I feel like that makes me stronger. Uh, it's also my only my space where I, where I can also have a, my own dialogue, ask questions to create a debate or communicate with the people to tell the stories out to the audience. Like me as a Sami reindeer herding woman and, and an artist and a filmmaker. So yeah, uh, and, and the last short uh, documentary movie I made, made uh, is called Alat. And I was following my brother and father uh, during the, um, the COVID period when everything was locked down everywhere, I think, in you know, all around the world, and uh, in Norway. So, um, and we also experienced uh, the huge uh, changes in the climate that year, because suddenly we had too much snow, when usually we have almost no snow. So last year we had too much snow, and that gave us a lot of trouble because our reindeers was almost starving to death because the weather was also changing. We could like suddenly start to rain and the other day was 20 minus and the ground gets ice and the reindeer has then problems to get through the ice to get down to the ground to find the food. So we had to feed our reindeer herd for the first time and I started to document this and following my family while we were moving with our reindeer herd from the winter area to the summer area. Uh, so it's called the spring mig migration in English. And then I, and, I, and I, I thought, okay, I have to feel more. I have to see what about the summer when they get the calves? Have we more calves this year or less? And of course we had less calves. And the, 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 the one of the things I found out and I asked my dad, why is it like that this year it's more female calves? that has been surviving or been born, you know, been born. And uh, my dad said, it's maybe because the female are actually more stronger than the male. So um, yeah, and then I also followed them, my family through the autumn when we were going back to the winter area. So um, like my dad says, like he can see the climate changes, it's real. And he's always outside in the nature and standing in the front line and I have to deal with that. And uh, so the weather has been really, really unstable for the past years in Northern Norway. Mm. Elda, I have to say from what I've seen of your work, that love, that deep love for your community really shines through. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, your the connection with the reindeer resonates with me because we have in my Gwich'in language, we call caribou vaksai, and we have a spiritual connection with them. And they have it's the same issues when we have that icy freeze over, they can't get to the lichen, they, can, they can't eat. And so we're faced with, of course, those same issues. And again, you know, there's definitely like this theme here, right, of us in the circumpolar north of, of the issues that we're facing. Um, and again, I 
it makes me feel less alone because there's that element too of like, for me, um, you know, growing up um, in in Alaska and oftentimes um, kind of isolated, like just in the cabin with my grandma without running water, <laughs> there was a lot of solitude and a lot of that feeling of, I'm so grateful now that I grew up without this technology, <laughs> to be honest, because um, there was so much self reflection. And I do see this theme of us, you know, having a curiosity about who we are in this world and sharing out a un that unique perspective. And um, on that note, Nyla, welcome. Hi, We're so welcome. excited that you're here with us. And thank you. Yeah, I'm and we <laughs> so sorry that I came in came in late. I don't know. I was I was actually in a color grade session today. I double booked myself, so I was. I'm glad I was able to. No worries. I'm, we're we're all happy it was because you were doing filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to go ahead and um, introduce yourself since we've already done introductions? Sure. Um, I my name's Nyla Nookshuk. I am. It's, the, it's really loud where I am. I'm in Toronto, so not in the circumpolar uh, Arctic right now. Um, although I'm from the Arctic, from Nunavut in Canada, um, I. Today, finished the color grade on my first feature, which is exciting. And um, we package it next week, which means it will be finally done. Um, and it's an alien invasion movie set in it's set in the Arctic in, in a tiny community, a group of girls, teenage girls taking on aliens. Um, lots of fun. Um, yeah, I, I like scary movies, horror movies comic books, video games, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's me. Happy to be here. Happy to chat with people. <laughs> yeah, Masi, um, Masi Cho, I'm so um, curious and interested mm -hmm. in this work that you're doing in this feature film that you have. I have to say that, um, to be quite honest, like I'm not a huge um, fan of horror films because they really scare me and I get nightmares, but my husband... <laughs> is a fanatic like he loves horror films my husband's also a filmmaker and he it's his dream to do um an indigenous like horror film so I'm so excited um about your feature and I guess what I'm like most curious about is like you know I, is I guess my question for you is like how do you embark on that knowing that we as indigenous people, we all do have some really scary stories. Yeah, <laughs> how do you like give yourself stories. the freedom? Yeah, how do you give yourself the freedom to like, I'm gonna do this? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I like, cause I, um, I, I mean, I did feel a little bit of guilt at some point being like, oh, I should be making movies. Like when, it, you know, that are telling the stories of my community and then like, you know, making these fun alien movies. I. I think that it, you know, it, for, for me, it was like, oh, I have, I, you know what, I, this is something that, these are the kinds of movies I watched growing up, I'd never seen, and, and even just to watch it today, like watch a movie that, you know, feels familiar, but it's just like all these brown faces on screen, um, in just a bunch of Indigenous kids, and doing a great job, and it just like being really, you know, it's really fun, I think, and and um, I think that that's, you know, it's, it's important for us to have movies that are fun and, 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 and kind of show the, the different kind of um, stuff that we like. Because, you know, I'm uh, growing up as like a, a nerd. It's, it's you know, I, I know that there's lots of other, you know, nerdy indigenous people out there. And, and um, so for me, it was, I, I kind of had grown up just loving movies like Goonies and E.T. and, and those kinds of um, those kinds of movies. And so to be able to do something like this and have, you know, monsters and, and blood and tentacles and all of that stuff, it was, it really was so much fun. It, it almost like reminded me of like when I was in high school making movies with my friends. Um, so it was, it really did kind of feel like a, like a dream come true. Um, <clears throat> but to kind of, um, yeah, it was kind of something that I'd always, I, I had this idea. I, I, and, and, you know, I've got lots of ideas, but I knew that this one, when I told people, you know, these teenagers from a, a, this tiny 
Arctic town where there's, where, you know, in the summer, the sun never sets um, and they take on this alien invasion. It was something that people responded to. Um, so I, I thought it was worth kind of taking on. Um, it was really challenging to, to, you know, find the right people to get on board. I, it, for a first feature, it was an ambitious project. Um, by nature of it being um, indigenous girls, indigenous teenagers, we weren't going to be casting any named actors, you know? So it was it, to justify saying, yeah, this is like worth making with, you know, these um, kids who'd never acted before, a director who'd never directed before. Um, but uh, we had a great, you know, we ended up getting, you know, really great supporters and and raising the money and and then you know when you kind of are looking for the kind of crew that are going to go and spend an entire summer in this tiny community where you you fly in and they were all having to there's not enough there wasn't enough housing in the community to um, support a crew coming in there's not enough housing in the community for the people that live there so um so for us to come in they basically let us move into the high school <laughs> and the public school. We sent out 55 beds and mattresses, moved them into the classrooms. Our crew was having to like have a roommate and live in a classroom for a couple of months, which is insane. And then working really hard during the day. Um, but it just meant the kind of people that signed up for that sort of thing were, were kind of special. Um, and it was, yeah, ended up just kind of being this, um, we, we were kind of told it would be impossible to make uh, a movie in such a remote community without the kind of infrastructure that um, a project like this would normally have. Um, and there was, you know, we were kind of thinking, oh, maybe we do have to film in a Khalouit, which is still a very small place of, of 7,000 people, but at least it's, it has more resources and things like paved roads and flights that come in more regularly. Um, but you know, we spent a little, just a couple of hours doing some location scouting in Pang, uh, which is also where my nephews are from. And, and it was, it was just, we realized it would be really special to just make it all there um, and have the whole community kind of just get on board, which is kind of what had to happen. Um, yeah, it was, it was just this, it was this great um, uh, collaborative, collaborative project that's that's you know we filmed it two years ago so the pandemic has put put things a little bit on hold but it's it's nice that it's well I'm so inspired that you did it because all of those elements um yourself being a first-time director non-actors like all of those challenges being and I also you know Alaska we have tons of small rural communities where I can see like doing a big feature production would be everybody staying in the school gym for sure <laughs> um but that's so inspiring um for I think uh, you know definitely probably for our audience but for myself who you know I've worked on uh, in animation and done short films but at some point want to do um a larger feature film you know with community and I'm just curious um, for, and this is a question for all of you, but that, that in particular, Nyla, um, did any of you um, film during COVID? And if you did, like, how did you um, set forth, um, you know, making sure that the community was taken care of? And, and if you didn't film during COVID in general, like, how do you um, make sure that the community is, is on board and that, you know, there's that reciprocity yeah. and care happening? Well, luckily I had, uh, within the year before we started filming, there was a release of this really great document in Canada called the um, Pathways and Protocols document, the Indigenous Pathways and Protocols. And it was created in partnership with Imaginative in Ontario Creates. And it basically gives, um, it's based um, largely on the, the rules created in Australia. Um, and I think it, it basically kind of is like, Based on community input, this is how we kind of can engage with with indigenous communities, and um, and it went beyond just it goes beyond just like the normal kind of like authentic representation that it, you know story should be told by indigenous people that sort of thing. It was it included things like making sure that when like we 
asked the council of, of Peng, of, we reached out in advance and asked for permission, not, and we, and we made sure that we were asking in English and in Noctitude and that this was like sent out to the community. And then we traveled there ahead of time and basically made a case for why we thought that it was that, you know, we, we said, this is the project. We, we love it. If you guys would let us film here. And it was, it's like, it just is like a, making sure that everyone feels like they're being heard. And then, then it's a time for being like, okay, well, like how do we make sure the community knows what's going on? Cause we've got people dressed up as monsters walking down the street. Like, and it, and, um, so it's, you know, it's like, okay, well we, you know, we'll have, so we, we have a local a person in town that does all of our translations for filming notices. And she'll also get on the radio and tell people like, okay, they're going to be over here on this day and that sort of thing. Um, but then also just obviously with, with crew and everything, you've got to have local crew and, and, um, and then it was also just important, um, with, to make sure that because of just the, the, the size of the project there, that something like these kinds of big projects that we're doing in our communities have such potential to be opportunities for mentorship and, and building capacity um, so that, you know, we can be going up and be making our own movies and, and having, you know, and what's so great about, especially in Hollywood with two of my producers, Stacey Agak McDonald and, um, and Alethe Arno Kapuril, who um, are fantastic filmmakers and producers uh, based out of the Hollywood. And they are in the process of potentially like building a studio in a Hollywood. And it's like, once we, the more kind of projects that we've got and the more people we're training, it's like, we can all just be building this ecosystem. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's finding the different partners and finding the time ahead of time to make sure, okay, we're training crew and, and that there's you know, training positions in every department. Um, and that just is stuff that you do have to, it takes time and money and so you just have to kind of set make sure there's extra money and extra time set aside for those kinds of things and that everyone knows that those things are important because there'll also be things that you know that if they're not planned for that they can just be neglected yeah that capacity building is critical and um, I definitely feel like every project that you know I'm engaged in that's like a big element to it and I love hearing about people that have worked on projects, you know, that I've been involved with then then go off and are actually doing the work. Um, that's always amazing to see as we, again, move towards narrative sovereignty. And I'm also very grateful for the pathways um, and protocol document. And I can't wait for us to have something similar in the States. Mm -hmm. um, Inuk and Elle, did you also want to answer that question of did you film during COVID and how you kind of create that community of care? Yeah, yeah. I um my um my short film that's in the program of Imaginative this year um was filmed during last summer. I mean, in the middle of of COVID. I mean, uh, and it was filmed on location in southern Greenland. I mean, Greenland has been it has been spared uh, a lot of the COVID troubles that's been happening around the world because, I mean, you basically fly in and out of one airport in Greenland, right? And you there there was a lot of rigorous testing of people going in and, and out of Greenland. So Greenland has had a pretty normal life, I mean, within the country. Um, but you couldn't really go abroad and you couldn't really, there were no tourists for like two years now, so which is a huge economic problem, but that's another thing, right? So, um, so I, I was lucky to be able to film, to film my little short film locally with um, with the help of a of of my uncle, for instance, and my and my dad, and which was a, a very nice experience for me to keep it um, to keep it that small and 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 very very local because um, in Greenland, in the community where this my film was filmed in the town of Nassa is a it's a, a it used to be a quite prosperous uh, small town in southern Greenland, but um, as maybe within the last 20 years, 30 years, um, it's become more and more pulverized. So um, so one of the things that I wanted to um, talk about in my film was this connection between um, having an income, a uranium mine, pretty, pretty much, and the, the, the poverty uh, of the place. 
and and to me that was that was a very interesting issue that I wanted to film. So I was very happy to be able to film it even during even during COVID, which was lucky for me. And um, I know speaking of the protocols, um, they, what did you call it? Right. The pathways and protocols. Yeah, that- yeah. I know. I, I know in, in, in Greenland, within the film community of Greenland, we, we are working on um, copy pasting it pretty much. No, I'm not copy pasting, but you know what I mean, right? Making it um, making it uh, Greenlandic. So that's something we we are really working on at, at the moment because I really think these documents are important not not just for ourselves, like like you said, Nyla, when you went to a, to a small community, but um, in Greenland we also see a lot of um, international interest, people who want to go there for big events or people who want to go there and film, and and. In my view, it's important that we we do let foreigners in and film uh, on our land as well. Um, it's more important that we tell we keep telling our own stories, but I think it's important that we also use at least in Greenland's perspective. I think it's there's a lot of um money, a lot of learning to be done within the film community of Greenland by letting. Uh, Big production foreign films come come. I mean, wouldn't it be great to have have Hollywood come and make something crazy in Greenland? That would involve like like all of us. I know that like at the moment there's a this this um, TV series which is a big thing in Denmark um, about uh, the political um, head of state. I think it's like half the season is being filmed in Greenland, in Ilulissat, in northern Greenland, with local talents. I mean, a lot of the uh, the, the youngsters that I've mentored or that I've known, right, that, that are younger than me, they now, they're, they're assistant directors. I mean, they, they, they help with the camera and all that. So, and I think that's a very, very nice thing for, for the local film community in Greenland to have have um, these uh, big, in this case, Danish companies come up and um, and like, you know, taking us in. And I and I do get that this is a way for them to um, to say, okay, we had indigenous people work on these projects, uh, and that I, I definitely see that. But I also think that it's important for us as indigenous to get that kind of knowledge because in Greenland, film there's no money in film in Greenland. We don't have a film fund. We don't have a film institute. We don't have places where we can where we can apply for funding just for film right we we have to compete so to say with every other art form which is crippling in a way because i mean we also need music we also need theater we also need literature and there's like this one pot of money in greenland for indigenous content so it's very important in my view that we at least in greenland's perspective that we do get we shine a light on on Greenland also as a location. So yeah, it's the same in Alaska. You know, like we don't have um, those resources available to us. We have no film commission, like nothing like that. We used to have a film incentive program, and we were seeing more production. Um, but I agree. I mean, I think that it's really about, and that's the the wonderful thing about the Pathway and Protocols document is like, how do we establish reciprocal, respectful um, engagement? You know, with our communities. And also, how do we get to the place where at the inception of a project, if it has anything to do with us as indigenous people, that productions are saying, okay, we need to bring in an indigenous writer. We need to bring in the indigenous director, producer, et cetera. But I do believe collaboration is important and it can be done, you know, in a good way. Um, Al, did you want to also speak to, you know, this question a little bit? (laughs) Yes, uh, well, I made A Lot, which is a short documentary movie. Uh, When the pandemic hit us, uh, and um, like you said, uh, you know, we didn't like, in our village in Godegeino, there are around 3,000 people, Sami people living there. And we didn't have COVID, but we have to follow the same rules as the other Norwegians. And uh, and when... uh, there was lockdown in Norway, then I started to uh, follow my family. And I called my one of my best friends, Ken Arabongo. I'm always working with him. He's a film photographer and really, really good. And he know, he's a Sami. I don't need to explain to him how it is to be on the tundra out in the wild with a reindeer herd. 
So he's always ready. I can call him like in the middle of the night and he's ready and we can like stay there. We don't know how long you're going to stay there, maybe one day or five days. So he know that. So um, I called him and asked him, do you, I want to make this sh short documentary movie. Uh, can you, are you awa available? And I didn't want to go other Sami reindeer herder families. I wanted to stay in my family because of the pandemic. And also I know every, almost every land and the structure and the family and all of the people. So I don't need to ask. I told them I'm, I'm gonna tell, uh, make a movie and they said, yeah, of course. And they trust me. And that's so important. I, th I think if there was a, like a Norwegian people who had come and asked, can we make a movie about you? They would probably said no. <laughs> because uh, they don't know so much about us. And I think if we, if a Norwegian would go up to the mountains, to the reindeer herd, they, they would probably freeze to death at day one because they don't know which kind of clothes they are gonna wear or how they're gonna sleep in a lab or, or what, what they are gonna eat. So, but I remember when the pandemic uh, hit us, I thought maybe I just escape to my reindeer herd and I just stay there until the pandemic is over. I have food there, I have. I can make my own clothes. I thought uh, maybe I go back to the 1800th century. <laughs> and I thought about like, how will, how did the Sami people survive and live back in the day? So maybe I should do that. I have water there, I can fish, I have woods, I can make fire, I don't, I, I, and we have labos. I, I'm not gonna die and I'm not gonna freeze. And, uh, well, you know, I grew up in Gordegate and we have like no cafes, restaurants or cinema. There is not so much things like who can like uh, steal my um, uh, attention, you know. So I'm used to that, to almost not have nothing there. So probably also maybe that's why I'm also working with art uh, and I know how to yeah, I, I'm like in a fairy tale. I just escape in that world and then I go there and I'm happy. And then sometimes I go out in nature and I'm, and I, you know, as an indigenous people, you are never alone in nature. So, um, yeah, that was my, my answer to that. So, yeah, I followed my family then from April to October uh, with uh, my best friend, Kenara. And then, uh, um, what was the other question? Yeah, we also have um, the Sami Pathfinder, Anna Laila Utsi from the International Sami Film Institute, and also from the Sami uh, Film Organization. Uh, they are like Sami filmmakers from the Swedish side and Finnish and Russia and Norwegian. They've been working with the Sami Pathfinder, inspired by you from Canada, and also from the Maori from New Zealand because we also experience the same thing as you do, that there are big companies coming up uh, and also Norwegians, professional Norwegian film producers, directors who want to tell our stories. And uh, I have uh, my colleagues in the Sami film industry and me also as well, we had the problem with the Norwegian Film Institute because that's really, uh, that's not very often we got funding from there because they don't know the, like the, the people who decides to, who, who would get the funding, they are Norwegians. They don't know almost nothing about us. They don't uh, understand us. They cannot like um, recognize themselves in the story, you know, and, and so on, you, you know. So um, we always, we often get like, no, you do not get funding. And then luckily we have the International Sami Film Institute, but they don't even have uh, so much money either. So, um, but then we also experience that they give money to Norwegians to come and tell our stories. <laughs> so, uh, but now we have the Sami Pathfinder who helps us, who guides the Norwegians and the outsiders, the foreigners, like what they should do, they should uh, talk with us, they should collaborate with us, uh, yeah. In, I see Enoch wants to get in on this conversation. <laughs> yes, very, very interesting. I, 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 I see, because Greenland is formerly still a part of the kingdom of Denmark, right? Um, but um, the Danish Film Institute won't 
really has a difficult time in funding Greenlandic film. And now that we are getting more and more organized within uh, from, from Greenland, I mean, they are very much opposed in us getting our own like film film institute and uh, i know that's a, it's a so yeah once again i think i think they're they're quite similar like you which is so Norway. frustrating because they they obviously the denmark has recognized that film is a really valuable you know just cultural tool and they've invested a lot of money into film in denmark and so yeah. the fact that they're just essentially i mean yeah. and not recognizing the fact that um that there's a you know, this, there's potential for all of these amazing stories to be told. And yes, uh, yeah. that the and, and you know, that that's not being supported. And I do think that very recently in Canada was the creation of the Indigenous Screen Office and only, um, I think it's been within the last like 18 months that they've created a Black film office. And it's just a recognition like, oh yeah, like we're not being fully seen by the traditional system. We have to create our own and and that you know we have to be in control of of the jury systems and it, and we deserve to have funds allocated to our own stories and and that that it actually isn't just a cultural um that we're it's not something to do just to like pat ourselves on the back this is like um that this is a good investment a good cultural investment um and that that these it you know that this is these are um, great stories uh, that that can be told and should be told by people that have been underrepresented. Um, so I think like actually creating our own, having the Indigenous Screen Office, and for the very first time this fall, they're going to be able to actually allocate funds. So we've had this this great office, which has been able to advocate for us as filmmakers within institutions and funding systems like Telefilm, but. We also now will finally have our own sources and not obviously it's like the, the film office, but but they'll be able to distribute funds and and determine um, the kinds of stories that that can get made um, from within the community, which I think is such an important. Um, hopefully it will kind of uh, it, it with with success if there's, you know, I, I can't see how there, there there's already so many great things that are coming out of this program. Mm -hmm that um, hopefully it will set a, a precedent for other, other countries like, um, you know, with, with, um, with like Norway and Denmark. And, and I think that like even conversations like this are really important because I know that my co-producers, Alethe and Stacey, who I mentioned, they're, they're producing a film and I think it's a Greenlandic director, but there are two are, they're kind of making case that you know, Canada, uh, that there's not, that Inuit, we, we kind of exist. Um, and the, the kind of the limitations of borders is, is, um, is actually kind of problematic. And if we don't, if we choose not to recognize those borders. So <laughs> there's like kind of this thing, like we, they should actually be able to get access to Canadian financing, even if they live in Greenland. And there's, it's being heard out. Like, I think that it's, you know, it's, it is progressing. So um, it, I think just the continued conversation and, and understanding that there's lots of shared, um, shared experience and, and shared problems um, that, that, you know, if, if we can be um, hopefully kind of building these, uh, can, like even um, communities that exist outside of our kind of territories. Yeah, I just want to uplift it. So um, my um, nation, the Gwich'in Nation, is goes across into Canada, across the border, and yet we're not able to oftentimes um, share resources. And so I, it's really encouraging to hear that there's that might be in the works. Mm -hmm. um, I know I've had so many um, frustrations myself um, around projects that I've worked on and really not been being able to do that. But I also just want to like really, you know, uplift that I feel like what we're engaging in here is a part of a just equitable solution based transition off of an extractive resource industry. Um, the arts absolutely need to be funded. I think it's critical for our world right now for us to get our indigenous stories out there, our values out there, and for people to see that there are other ways besides 
mining for uranium or drilling for oil um, to to really make a living. And there's these other economies um, that are that are just renewable. And I'm just really inspired um, by the work that each one of you are doing. And I just send you so much love and blessings for all of your creative work and projects. And it feels so good to know that we are we're not alone and we're all bound together here. Um, and I know that our, our time here is short and like wrapping up, but I, I hope that we can um, continue this um, conversation in other spaces. So, Masicho, um, Koyanapak, <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you to yeah. Imagine Native for hosting us here. Thank you so much, Olugihito. Yeah, thank you, Koyanapak.